Take our Bibles out. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter... I want to go back to 2 for just a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In fact, I think that's where we are. Let me see. Yeah, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 2. I, we had a problem, or I had a problem with a verse, and it, it, I don't know how I got so confused on it, but I did. And so I want to go back and I actually wrote out what I want to share with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. You'll remember as I read it, the problem we had. It says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let me just pull that apart and kind of explain to you. He that is spiritual, that's a saved person. A person that is saved, and according to previous verses there in chapter 2, he's indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We understand that we are indwelt by the Spirit of God as we are saved. And so this is, a, this is who we're talking about when he talks about he that is spiritual. It says he judges all things. A, a person who's saved and has the Holy Spirit indwelling them, they have a spiritual discernment that's associated with the wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. So this is who he's talking about. He that is spiritual judges all things. We have the ability to discern. Uh, that's why you, you may you look at something and, and to you, the discernment that's in you makes you aware this isn't right. Something's not right about that. And that's the Holy Spirit's wisdom in you telling you that. Whereas somebody who's lost, they look at it and go, well, it's, that, it's not that bad, come on, you know. And they don't realize because the discernment's not there. Then he says this, Yet he himself is judged of no man. So this saved person, filled with the Spirit, who judges all things, has this discernment. He's not judged of anyone. The saved are not able... I'm sorry. The saved are not able to be judged by the unsaved. Because the unsaved lack spiritual discernment. Remember the verse we read previous to this, where it says, The natural man perceiveth not the same things of God, uh, discerns not the things of God. Well, that's because he's not saved. And so he can't judge from that viewpoint. He can't judge us as Christians who have the Spirit of God in us because he doesn't understand what we have. So he's not able to judge us. The saved, on the other hand, understand that judgment is left to the Lord. And only God can judge him. Amen? Amen. That's good to know, isn't it? What does your shirt say, baby? It says, leave the judging to Jesus. There you go. Leave the judging to Jesus. That's a good thing to do. So we understand. For whom, he says, for, whom ha, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? It's a question. Who has the mind of the Lord to be able to instruct a Christian? Only the saved have the mind of the Lord, and only through the work of the Holy Spirit is there a place for a Christian to instruct another Christian. We understand that because we, well, right now, you've got a Christian instructing Christians. That's something we do, and, and we expect that. And if we love our brothers, we encourage them, and we, we may even instruct them in things. That's, there's nothing wrong with that because we have the Spirit of God working in us who gives us that ability to instruct. But then he, he sums it up with this, but we have the mind of Christ, right? Because we're saved. We have the mind of Christ. Do you realize you have the mind of Christ? Sometimes it's a little guarded, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it doesn't come out when we really need it, but it's there. We have the mind of Christ. And so the text, but he that is spiritual judges all things, that's the same. Yet he himself is judged of no man because the lost man can't judge him. A Christian will not want to judge him because he knows that's left up to the Lord. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who? We have the mind of Christ. So we would be the ones who would instruct him, not the unsaved. So that's that verse, those two verses. So just in my explanation of that, there you have it. And that's what I have to say about that. Now then, let's go to chapter 3. We were down to verse 6, actually. But I want to pick up a little before that, as always. Uh, there was a conflict going on in Corinth because there were people that were choosing up sides based on who they followed. Huh, does that not sound familiar to today's church, seems like? 
uh, you know, well, we're this group, we're that group, we belong to this group, we belong to this denomination, that denomination, blah, 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 blah. And Paul is, he kind of puts it down. I, uh, I particularly love this because I understand that, that uh, denominationalism is not in the Bible. Do you hear me? Denominationalism is not in the Bible. You know, it's, all Baptists don't go to heaven. That's not a Bible thing. Uh, you know, all Pentecostals don't go to heaven. All Episcopalians don't go to heaven. It's, it's not in the Bible, it's denominations. That's one thing I love about our camp meeting. And I think the, the thing that God's brought out of that for us is the fact when we meet together underneath that tent, do what? It's the family of God. It's just, it's, it's, not, it's not individuals from different churches. The minute we walk under that tent, it's like we just are a single family. It's exciting. I think it's an awesome thing. And I think that's what Paul is dealing with here. These people were carnal Christians. And uh, there was a lot of strife. In fact, it says, verse 3, are you, For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I'm of a Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Why? Because they were choosing sides. Verse 5, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers, deacons, servants, by whom you believe? They may have led you to the Lord. They may have been the ones that led you to Christ, even as the Lord gave to every man someone to share the gospel with them. Now verse 6 is where we pick up. Paul says, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. I, uh, you lead a new Christian to the Lord, and if you've never had this happen, you haven't led enough people to the Lord, this is what will happen. You lead somebody to Christ, and pretty soon you'll have a testimony service, and somebody will say, oh, yeah, you saved me. Remember when you saved me? You know, <laughs> And you grin because you realize you didn't save anybody. God saved them. We either planted or watered. But God's the one who saves. God gives the increase. I, and I particularly love this about the church. This is what the church needs to understand. God gives the increase. A lot of pressure is put on preachers, not this one. Praise God, I think you understand this. But a lot of pressure is put on preachers if they don't perform well. And performing means getting more people to come to the church. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting more people to come to church, but that's the job of building the church is not the preacher's, it's not yours, it's God's. And that needs to be echoed over and over and over again because there's many a preacher that takes credit for what God has done, you know, and... Uh, I, I try to be very careful about that kind of thing. Each of us, like Paul says, has a particular job to do. Every person in here, God created you, God puts you as a part of the body of Christ for a reason. There's something in your personality, there's something in your spiritual gifts that God has placed you in the body of Christ to operate, to be functioning. And uh, we ought to be doing that, just as Paul said, I plant, Apollos, he waters. That whatever God has put you in the body of Christ for, be faithful to do it. Then God can bring the increase. Verse 7 says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. If you're just a water boy, or you're just a migrant farmer, <laughs> you know, putting seed in the ground, you have nothing to do with the growth of that plant. Have you ever planted anything? It's amazing. I think kids, kids get this, I think, better than anybody. You know, when you were little and you were in school and you planted a bean, some kind of bean you brought from the house, you know, so I think most of us brought pinto beans or corn, kernels of corn, and you'd drop it in the dirt and, you know, over the weeks you'd water it and pretty soon it would start to come up. Somehow, to children, it's easily understood that they have nothing to do with the growth of that plant. They planted it, they watered it. But then it grows. God did that. 
when I see some of these old oak trees, I've got one in my front yard. Y'all have seen my oak tree in the front yard. It's, it's, it's ready to die. It's, it's gone as far as it can go, I think. But it's, uh, it's been there for a long, long time. And when I mow around that thing, I can't help but think that one day that thing was nothing more than just a little acorn in the ground. And now from that little acorn, look at all that's been produced, this huge tree. And where did all that wood come from? You know, where did it come from? Well, God created it. Man didn't. God did. And that's the same thing in the church. If we can sit back and say we did it, then it's not God's work. It's when we can see God doing it. That's when we know it's God's work. God brings the results. Men should never take the credit for God's work. When we faithfully do our job, the one God made us for, there is a reward. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. If you're, if you're waiting around for a reward because you're attached to somebody else, that's not the way you're supposed to get your reward. You're supposed to get your reward on your own. Amen? And our jobs should be done as Christ empowers us to do them. And then they ought to be for Him because they are by Him that we're able to do them. I, you know, I think probably the biggest problem we have in churches is that people take on jobs and then they try to do them. They have in their mind what it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to work and they try to do it instead of just letting God do it. We've got to learn to trust. We've got to, got to just let God do things and uh, stay out of his way sometimes. My daddy was a carpenter. And I found out as, a, as his son, when I would go work for him during the summer, one of my greatest uh, jobs was to stay out of his way. You know what I mean? Be within call in case he needs me, but stay out of the way so he could get the job done. And normally I'd be picking up nails and picking up boards and taking things to the fire. But if dad needed something, he just, Jim, and I knew immediately that I, I was right there. I was there when he needed me. In God's work, I found it to be the same way. Just stay busy doing the things I know I'm supposed to do and be available when God is ready to use me in some way. But let God do the work. Let him be in charge. It sure makes it a lot easier. You know, we stress and we wear ourselves out, you know. I'm just so tired. I work around that church all the time. Pastors have burnout, you know. Have you ever heard pastors have burnout? And I've read about it and I've looked at it. And I thought, well, am I having burnout? Have I had burnout? I don't know if I've ever had burnout. And I, I think I haven't had burnout yet. I've only been doing this for, well, most of my life, but here for 25 years and I haven't experienced burnout yet. I, I don't know when I'm going to do it. When can I look forward to that, right? It, it's, it's not coming. I don't know what's happening. But you see, whenever you trust God for your power, your strength, and for the work, why should I be being burned out? I think if a pastor gets burned out, and I'm saying this, and you watch and see, I'll have a nervous breakdown next week. But <laughs> if pastors are getting burned out, I think it's because they're, they've taken on the work of God to be their own, and it never was intended to be ours. It's God's work, that's what Paul understood. You think maybe that's how Paul didn't have burnout? I mean, if anybody deserved to have burnout, Paul had it, right? He deserved it, I mean, bless his heart, he not only mentally and spiritually gave himself to the work of God, but physically, he literally wore himself out, and yet we don't find him crying about it's too much work. I just can't do any more. He asked for prayer. He asked for prayer to be bold. But uh, I don't find him doing that. Well, again, you find a man of God who is trusting God for the power and the strength and the wisdom to do the work that God's doing. There's no reason for him to be burned out. Verse uh, 9. Oh, look, watch this. He says, verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We're, we're all part of this thing. We, we need each other. 
And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together. Even though we receive our gifts, or we receive the rewards, excuse me, we receive the rewards for the work that God has done through us, individually, we understand we did it together. We need each other. God didn't call us to be hermits. God didn't call us to live all... That's why the, the COVID thing just doesn't work for church building. Because God never intended for us to sit at home and not be a part of the church. He said, we need each other. In fact, God said the worst thing, the first thing God said wasn't good was what? That man would be alone. So understand, we're never intended to be alone. We're to be with people, around people. Uh, we're to be involved. And Sunday I'll be talking about we're to love people. Uh, even the people that are unlovable, we're to love them. And we're going to deal with all that Sunday. But we have this responsibility and we're laborers together with God. So it's not just you and me, it's God. We're laborers together with God. He's doing the work. I've shared this before. When dad would go to work, I would ask, can I go with you? And, and when he'd say yes, I'm telling you what, a little 12 year old boy, I get excited over the opportunity to go to work with my dad. Cause usually it meant I got to drive the truck. 12 years old. Usually it meant I got to drive a nail or learn something. Usually it meant I got to go eat lunch with dad. I mean, all those things were part of working with dad. Listen, I get to do the same thing with my heavenly father. Every morning when I get up and I get in my truck, and I start down this way, I'm going to work with dad. We're just going to work. And uh, sometimes I roll my window down and hang my, my arm out the window just like I did with dad, you know, because I'm going to work with dad. What a great thing we get to do because we're in this together with God. It isn't just us, it's God. Now then, he says, you are God's husbandry. You are God's building. You are not your own plant farm, amen? You're not your own plant farm producing your own fruit. God does it. And he does it in connection with your willingness to work. Your willingness to work. It's all coupled. It's all part of it. Everything's part of it. Your willingness to be there, your willingness to work, your willingness to be available, that's all part of it. God does the work. It's God's plant farm. It's God's plantation that we're working on. In fact, he says you are God's building. You're not your own building. You're God's building. Jesus is your foundation laid as a result of of men like Paul used by God to present the truth to you. And when you got saved, the foundation was laid. Paul is not the foundation. Listen, he says that. He says, you are God's building. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth their own. He lays the foundation, but he's not the foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ. And then we build upon that foundation our lives. The master builder, I think, is a great picture of a soul winner laying the foundation. You know what? We're going to do this building out here, and we got the architect to draw up plans uh, for a foundation. And it's very critical. They did testing of the ground. They did all that stuff to make sure that we get the right amount of steel in there so that whenever we pour that slab, it doesn't crack. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't falter uh, in the building process. So we have a firm foundation. You don't have a firm foundation, you're not going to have much of a house. It's got to be firm. It's got to be right. It's got to be done right. And that master builder learns to put the firm foundation in. And that foundation, he says, is none other than Jesus Christ. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. We are to labor. We are to work alongside God in building upon this foundation the house that God wants us to have. Okay, we've done that. Uh, and he says, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Not something Paul produces, but Jesus Christ. That's not church membership. You hear me? That's not church membership. 
That's Jesus Christ. Nine years old, little boy got down on his knees and prayed, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I've done bad things, but I want you to come in my heart. I want you to save me right now. That little nine-year-old boy, foundation was laid, and for the last 60, almost 60 years, he's been building, God's been building on top of that foundation. Now, I can be honest with you, my house doesn't look real good at times. There's times when I build with the wrong materials. I tend to take on the responsibility for building the building and I tend to make it go where I want it to go and do look like I want it to look, but that's not what we're to do. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So we'll determine what kind of work we did. And I want to tell you, there's two kinds of work. There's work that we produce and there's work Jesus or God produces through us. One is wood, hay, and stubble and the other is gold, silver, precious stone. You figure it out, right? And here he's describing the day when it will be made manifest. Well, if you want to, put out beside that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. And this is the description of what that day looks like. It is the, the judgment seat of Christ. It happens after the rapture, while we are in heaven waiting to come back for Jesus' return. The judgment seat of Christ will take place. It's also called the Bema seat, if you've ever heard that. Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 describes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according as he had done, whether good or bad. That's not about um, judging whether or not you're going to be saved or not. That's already settled. Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation. So that's not what this is about. This is about determining what kind of works you put into your house. What kind of works you've done on your foundation. And if they're good, if they are that which has been produced by God, then they will, they will turn into a beautiful crown. We'll talk about that in just a second. But if they are of a lesser sort, if they are produced by you in some way trying to produce something in your life, then it's going to be burned up. I have in my mind a picture of this. I've shared it with you before, but I think it's a great a conveyor belt. And it goes into a furnace. It's like a, well, anyway, a furnace. And it rolls through there and comes out the other side. And so everybody takes their house, and here you are standing in line, for your house to be judged, for better terms, to receive your reward. And so you're standing there, and there around you is the Apostle Paul. And he's got a house in a buggy because he can't carry it in his hands. It's so huge. And then there's others that have houses that are kind of crumbly. They, they're kind of falling apart. Maybe yours is like that, I don't know, but kind of crumbly, and you're kind of holding it together trying to keep it together. Have you ever watched those guys build those gingerbread houses on TV? They had a whole series on that. That's amazing, the things they could do. But they get it all together, and all of a sudden they try to move it, and what happened? It just fall apart. Some people are going to be like that, standing in line. Others of you, you may be standing behind somebody like a Ural Massey. And you know, if I'm standing behind your old Massey, I may be wanting to try to hide my house, you know. But you put it on the conveyor belt and it goes through. And it comes out the other side. And when it does, all the gold, silver, and precious stone comes out and it's formed into a beautiful crown. That's all the work that you allowed God to do through you. And because of that, when the Lord gives you that, you recognize that this is not something I've done. Lord, this is something you've done. You've graced me with the opportunity to work with you and you accomplish these things in my life. Lord, let me give these back to you and we will cast those at his feet. I'll share that with you in just a second. Others, they'll come through. Maybe they were big, ornate houses, but they were built from the wrong material and they come out the other side and they wind up with a foundation piece of concrete. Jesus Christ, it's good, but no, nothing to offer the King, nothing to offer the Lord. So it's a good time. It's a bad time. That's why I think 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the good or the bad. Verse 12, now if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 
Every man's work shall be made manifest for that day. Oh, I've skipped that verse. Okay. Uh, shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire and shall try every man's work. And what sort it is. Verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Okay, you want to hear about this? Right out beside that, Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to read it to you. Revelation 4, 10 and 11. This is in heaven. Paul or John has gone into heaven. He's basically witnessed the rapture, although it hadn't taken place yet. And he's stepping into heaven. And there he sits, he stands around this huge throne. And around there is the four and twenty elders. And it says the four and twenty elders. Now, who are they? Four and twenty elders. Twenty-four people. You know who they are? The twelve tribes of the Old Testament. The twelve apostles of the New Testament. It's, it's all of God's people uh, here. It is all the saints from the Old Testament and New Testament. And they fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns. Where did those crowns come from? I just read it to you. The rewards that we receive in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You give it right back to Him. What a wonderful thing that we get to do. Verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Not his salvation, but he himself shall be saved, it says. You see that? You may lose everything in this judgment that you've built all your life. You may lose it all, but you won't lose your salvation. If you've built your life around selfish desires and selfish needs and all the rest, yeah, your, your house is probably going to get burned up, but you'll still be saved. And that's the great thing about it. We showed a, a film in here one night called The Bema Seat. It was wonderful, called The Bema. And it was wonderful. And the man was standing there thinking about, I'm going to go up there and Jesus is going to critique me and tell me how terrible I was because I didn't witness and I didn't share uh, as many times as I should and all the rest. And, and he got up there and he was all, he'd worked, worked through his life about how he had failed here and he'd failed there and he hadn't done what God wanted to do. And he steps up in front of Jesus and Jesus begins to commend him for the fact that in his life he had influenced this one person and that one person had been influential in winning many people to Christ. And God commended him for that. Never condemned him because Romans 8, 1 says you'll not be condemned, but you'll be rewarded accordingly. So that's kind of where that's at. You suffer loss, but you won't lose your salvation, yet is by fire. Verse 16, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now let's stop just a second. It almost seems like he changes tone. He's talking about a house and a foundation and buildings and all the rest. But listen, he's talking about the, the life of a Christian. And here he's continuing the thought. Let's keep it in context, what Paul has been talking about. Building and foundation of Christ. What is the building that one lives? Verse 16 tells us, know you not that you're the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We are a house, yes, but we're a house for God's indwelling. The purpose of God making the foundation and letting us build upon that foundation is to provide the place for the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what that's all about. That the Spirit of God may dwell in you. I love that too. You know, I, people struggle, I think, with that. It's almost scary, I think, sometimes when you tell somebody, you know what, when you get saved, God's going to move into your life. And they're going, oh no, what's that going to be like? You know, what's that going to feel like? You know, is that going to be like surgery or something? I mean, is that going to hurt when he moves in? You know, they don't realize, but you have God in you. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. The creator of the universe living in you. He's there. You have the power of God at your disposal. He's in you. Verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which is the temple you are. Now, listen to what he says. By bringing in and using materials that do not promote God's holiness, then we defile the temple of God. Him shall God destroy. Well, does that mean I'll lose my salvation? No. It's not what he's talking about. 
the chastisement of God upon that which cannot be saved. He chastises our bodies. Uh, he may cause us to die. He may take us home early. Uh, he may take us uh, out of this place because we become such a terrible witness. But because we are to be holy, we are to be the temple. We are to be an example. Which temple you are, he says. I'm going to stop there. That's a great place to stop. So we're going to stop there. Just understand that God, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You you walking around out here and you think you you know you're just you, but you are the temple of God. You know this old church. You know we think this church. You know you may think it's pretty or not pretty. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter how ornate this building is. This isn't the temple of God. You are. Take care of it. Be a demonstration of it. Let people see it in you. That people know that you have the Spirit of God in you as you listen to Him, follow Him. I had a fellow, I, I don't know if this applies or not, I think it does. Let me see if I can make it apply. I think it does. His name was Bill Jones. Bill Jones was a, uh, his dad owned a uh, automobile shop there in uh, Longview. And uh, as an unsaved man, he had... Uh, Bill had, the boy had bought an old 60, I think it was a 64, 65 Chevrolet Impala. And he had dialed that thing, it was an SS, you know, it was, a, it was, it was nice. And he had done all the work himself, and it was immaculate. Everything on it was primo, perfect, absolutely perfection. And uh, he took care of it, and he was very proud of it. Well, God saved him, and... Uh, he went off to school. He went to a Bible college, and at the Bible college, it was kind of one of those where everybody wanted to judge everybody else to make themselves look better kind of a thing. One day, he came into his dorm room, and his dorm partner was sitting there, and he said, Bill, I'm, I'm concerned for you. He said, why is that? He said, I think you've made that car your God, and you don't take care of it, or you, you, take too, you, you spend too much time and money on it. Well, Bill got convicted. He thought, man, if people think that about me, then I'm going to stop. And so he just quit. And he let the car just, just, it was dirty all the time. It balled tires on it, you know, smoke, all the things that a car would do at time. And it just kept going downhill. Well, there were those that appreciated that. But there were a number of them, young men who had seen him, how he cared for that. And they cornered him up one day and said, Bill, you're a terrible testimony of what God is to you. God's blessed you with this automobile, and you took care of it, and then you quit taking care of it. What kind of testimony is that to the world? You might think, man, he couldn't win either way. But the truth is, is that was, I think that was right. I think, I think he did more damage by not caring for that automobile. And I know that sounds funny because it was a testimony of his stewardship of the things God gave him. And when he quit taking care of those things, people quit looking. They'd shake their heads. Man, if I had that car, you know, I'd take care of it. And they, they lost that testimony that he had. Well, needless to say, he started taking care of his car again. Last time I saw him, I don't know if he still had the car or not, but Bill was a wonderful Christian and a fine, fine man of God, a witness for the Lord uh, because he was concerned about his witness. I think that's true of us as our temple, you know? Take care of our temple. We need to take care of it and uh, so that we are a witness to those around us that we truly are the temple of God. Any question, comment, or thought? No? Oh, okay, good. Let's stand and be dismissed to the word of prayer. Thank you for being here tonight. We don't want you to have no I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I said we don't want you to have no Thank you, thank you. Yes, that's good. Okay. Sweat drops and all that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you tonight. I thank you for the fact that you allow us to be the, 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 uh, the dwelling place of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that in your wisdom you chose us out to be that dwelling place, to be the temple 
of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that we would live in such a way that we'd be a witness to those around us, that we truly have your Spirit in us and that we care for that temple that you give us. Let us be, Father, who we're supposed to be for you. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.